uh, I would like to thank the uh, links uh, uh, for uh, for inviting me here to give this uh, this talk. I hope I hope it's going to be useful. So I, I think this more in a lecture, like a conversation of whatever what, what's what's happening in this new exciting field. And uh, you know, the few I, if I can tell the the few things that I've learned, or some of it may be useful for others to to actually work in is in something that I believe is really like a revolution in science that happened in the last 10 years. So without further ado, I will go uh, to, um, to, to, the, uh, to the talk and I, I just want to say it's going to be structured this way. So I will first tell you a bit about uh, X-ray FELs. So what they are, how they work. I, I wasn't sure about the background of this, um, of this crowd. I mean, I know that some of you may work with X-rays, other with neutrons. If if anything, even if you know this very well from X-rays, I think the, the history is of how things happen it could be useful to tell when you give your own uh, uh, lectures and presentation. Then I will show you uh, some examples about science that can be done there. I mean, I will take it at a very high level. I mean, the point of this seminar is not to go into detail of any of all the science being done also because I could tell you in detail about my own field, condensed matter physics, I will not be able to you tell much about other fields. And then as uh, Anurag said, I mean, I will maybe tell you a few things that uh, I learned th through the years and seeing how this thing works because how to get beam time to do experiments here. It is as difficult as get beam time to this facility almost as getting one of the big grants. But I, I wouldn't say there are tricks. There is a way of thinking and way of, of, uh, of preparing yourself. I think preparation and thinking and, and doing hard work is the, is the key. But hopefully help and uh, you know you can maybe start using these uh, these machines in your own research all right so this is a very basic slide for anyone that does um, x-ray science uh, but i just wanted to put it there just to, um, to tell you like you know the very basic of what has been used in x-rays for the past 30 years which is the synchrotron light and the, um, the way the synchrotron works, it, has, um, it accelerates uh, electrons uh, almost at the speed of, light, uh, speed of light into a storage ring. Wait a second, sorry, yes. Uh, the storage ring, in the storage ring, the uh, electrons um, uh, emit the X-rays every time they, they actually get turned by, by, uh, by a magnet. The ring is actually a polygon. So it's not, it's not round. It's as a polygon on each a corner, but it's an, you know, a so-called insertion device. So the bending of the electrons done with the magnetic fields, and the more magnets you put, uh, put it very simply, it's the more direction the X-ray emission is. And the, the big, so the, if you think about the generation of X-rays is basically, uh, of course, it's not only that, but it, the, the change in, in how the light was produced is by the advancing the technique of this, uh, uh, first bending magnet, then wiggler, and then undulators. And then you can also use them to control the polarization of light. At best, so if you do the, uh, the things very well, and Max 4 and Loon is the best so far, you can actually get a pretty high degree of coherence, which is nevertheless not full, because these are not lasers. And at best, you get basically, that's what Max 4 has, 10% of coherence in the soft X-ray range. Is uh, And this is simply scales with the uh, well, with a lot of things, Max 4 has, has a particular design also to, to do this, but this is what, what basically you get. If you want to go to the next step and have a fully coherent beam, you need to bring, bring a laser. And this is what the, um, the FEL, the free electron laser, have allowed to do, uh, have opened up for. So, and then what I will show you, I think is one of the best videos so far. It's a bit old now, but it still explains the principle in FEL. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but this is the way they explain it. They put a video to explain how an FEL works at, uh, at, at Stanford. So I'll, I'll let it go and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop it at some point and, and go on. The Slack National Accelerator Laboratory is located in the heart of California's beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. Operated by Stanford University or the U.S. Department of Energy, Slack has been home to the world's longest particle <clears throat> accelerator for nearly 50 years. In 2009, Slack ushered in a new era in its long history of physics research with a new kind of laser called the Linac Coherent Light Source, or LCLS. The LCLS is the first laser in the world to produce hard X-rays, which can be used to see 
down to the level of atoms and molecules. Adding almost half a mile onto the original two mile long accelerator facility, the LCLS uses the final one third of the accelerator to produce powerful pulses of X-ray laser light. Scientists at SLAC and around the world will use these powerful beams to create movies of how atoms and molecules move and behave on some of the shortest time scales imaginable. The LCLS starts with the drive laser, which generates a precise pulse of ultraviolet light, seen here in red. The drive laser pulse travels down to the injector gun, where it strikes the surface of a copper plate inside the gun. The copper cathode plate responds with a burst of electrons, seen here in blue, which are guided into the linear accelerator. Inside the accelerator, the electron bunch encounters the first of two magnetic chicanes, or bunch compressors. These chicanes help even out the arrangement of electrons of different energies in each pulse by sending the pulses along a slight S-curve. The compressed pulse emerges from the chicane and is accelerated further, gaining energy as it travels. The electron bunch then encounters the second bunch compressor. The second bunch compressor is longer than the first because the electrons in the pulse now have even greater energy. The electron pulse continues to the end of the accelerator at nearly the speed of light, finishing the boost phase of its ride and an energy over 12 billion electron volts. The electrons enter the beam transport hall, along which they travel through a series of diagnostic monitors and focusing magnets that help keep the beam precisely shaped and on course. Here, into the undulator hall, the electron pulse enters the heart of the LCLS, where the X-ray laser light is generated. The undulator hall houses a long array of special magnets, which comprise thousands of alternating north-south magnetic poles, spaced only a few millimeters apart. These alternating poles cause the electron bunch to swerve back and forth in an undulating motion that forces the electrons to give off X-rays. As the electron bunch and X-rays proceed together, they start to interact with each other. The electrons arrange themselves in parallel sheets, causing the X-rays to become in tune with each other, or coherent, with an enormous boost in X-ray power. Once the X-ray laser light is generated, the electrons must be safely discarded before the X-rays can be used for experiments. The beam dump uses a powerful electromagnet to divert the electrons down to a special chamber that absorbs the electrons and dissipates their energy. The X-ray pulse, unaffected by the pull of the magnets, continues on in a straight line. When fully operational, this entire process will happen up to 120 times per second. The X-ray laser pulse is now ready for scientists to use in one of the six LCLS experimental stations. Okay, I think I can I can interrupt it here. So to the point where uh, we see how that the this X-ray pulses are generated, and so I think this video made it very very uh, very nicely explain it also with animations. But basically, uh, you need two. I mean, there were two big ingredients to actually make this work. First, you needed a linear accelerator, a LINAC to accelerate the electrons at the speed of light. But the, uh, the the difference, or I would say the uniqueness when they do it is here, of course, you have LINAC even in the secretron, but then uh, and in a booster and you put it in a ring. Here you get to higher energy and you go into a straight line. And the reason is that, as I said, you want to go to higher energy and then you want to have femtosecond bursts of these electrons. So you start from a femtosecond laser and you can accelerate them and you can actually uh, compress them. Uh, the, um, the reason why you can compress these bunches so much, the reason why you can make femtosecond electron buckets is because you actually bring this to such high energy that uh, you're really in a relativistic regime and you, uh, it's, it's a way to see actually how relativity works in this case. 
uh, typically you have space charge problems. You cannot put electrons too close to each other. But if you accelerate them too close to the speed of light, there is a, a renormalization of the frame of where they live. And so they can, you can actually, uh, in, our, in our reference frame, they're pretty more compressed. So that's, that, that's the idea. So you need femtosecond lasers and you need um, um, an LENAC that is able to bring these, these electrons to such high energies. And the, the second part that was, um, that was built, and it, it has the same name as the, as the object that you have in the synchrotron, which is the ondulator, uh, but it's a special kind. This is much longer. So typically, I, I don't know, but it's a few meters an ondulator of a, as a synchrotron. This is, uh, it, it can be a hundred meters. And this has to be perfectly aligned uh, down to a, micro, a micrometer precision to allow for this um, uh, coherent um, uh, alignment of the electrons. And this is basically the, uh, the, the it's called microbunching. So the first electrons start to emit photons. And since they're traveling basically at the same speed, the photons that emit start to order the electrons. So you get this wave that gets on getting amplified and more and more coherent. So you start from, from a mass and you end up with a uh, ordered bunch of electrons. And this process is called uh, self-amplified spontaneous emission. If you go to FEL, the, you, will always, you will often order the word SASE or SASE. This SASE process is this one. You take electrons uh, that are incoherent and you put in an ondulator and you actually make them coherent. And the idea came from independent from three persons is John Mady, Evgeny Saldin, and, and Claudio Pellegrini. The, uh, just to give you an idea how what, what an FEL can do, what, what was the jump uh, given by the, uh, the, the, the FEL in terms of brilliance, which is usually a quantity that we like to calculate uh, for, for synchrotrons or for, for light sources. Um, if, let's look at the, uh, at the point of uh, one kilo electron volt photon or one nanometer wavelength. So X-rays, soft X-rays, let's put it this way. So the best synchrotron has this number, forget about the, uh, the, the, the unit. I mean, it's of course units that tells you how many photons per second, what is the angle, what is the area, what is the bandwidth, okay? It's, it's, it's the standard way to define brilliance. But this, this exponent is important, it's, it's 10 to the 23. Well, when the FEL were introduced, the first FEL, it was a jump of nine orders of magnitude. And I forgot who did this joke, but uh, the chances of getting a Nobel Prize uh, correlates directly with the jump in a logarithmic plot. And this is what, what an FEL, uh, the, the advent of the FEL has brought. So it's not unreasonable to think that this invention, this creation will actually lead to, uh, to, to a Nobel Prize. Um, the, uh, what I will do now is, uh, is just to show you some historical picture, just because I think it's good to do it. On, uh, it's not meant to give you a lot of information, technical information about what I'm gonna show, but just to have an idea what's, what's happening. Because from the first um, um, FEL 10 years ago, uh, LCLS, and now we already have, uh, well, several. We, I think soon we're gonna get close to 10 of those. So it went very fast. And so this was the, besides all the parameters, I just took the slide from zero one, but this is basically the, what you see in the plot there is the first light in 26 of April, 2009, that uh, the LCLS uh, saw. And the, just to show you, so this was the first light, a picture of the ondulator hole at, at Stanford. And this is actually uh, this SASE process that was mentioned. What you get is actually, it's already gives you an idea that it's, it's nice, you get coherent uh, emission of the light, but you see, if you look at the, at the energy, so this, uh, it's, uh, you, of course you have the energy that you want to have, but you do have some noise around this. So this is a, often called the SASE spikes. So this process, we generate very intense burst, still have um, a, a typical um, spectral feature, which is not the one that you use, usually see in a laser, which is nice and, uh, and, and round, but this is still, Despite this, this is still such such a uh, jump in, in in technology that that this has been even in, with this quality of light, it's not yet a full laser light. It's still ex been extremely useful, and I will show you in a moment. Uh, this was LCLS in the beautiful uh, Portola, Stanford Valley, and uh, soon after that, there was the uh, the Japanese FEL started to operate. Uh, the technical advancement that they, they did there was to use in vacuum ondulators. This is a technicality, but basically what you can remember, it allowed to build shorter machine and produce harder extra radiation, meaning you can get to even shorter wavelength. 
this was a big uh, as a technology development it, so, it sounds very simple but technically it was very difficult to realize and uh, this is at where spring gate is then if you go to the other end so at spring gate they only have hard x-rays at lcrs they can generate both soft and x-rays then if you go to the other side the very soft x-rays there is fermi at Electra in italy and uh, this is the only machine still so far which doesn't use a SASE process to generate X-rays, but uses so-called external seeding. So there is a laser which actually modulates your electron bunch and before it gets into the undulator. So uh, the, the quality of the laser is imprinted in then uh, on the quality of the X-ray get, get out, which is a sort of a harmonic generation. And this allows to give uh, longitudinal coherence. So the, the full coherence that the FEL have is typically a transverse coherence, but with this seeding, you also get the longitudinal coherence. And if you look at the spectral shape of this, it's a perfect uh, uh, line in energy. So these noisy sizes spikes are, are gone. The limitation here is, of course, that this process is not easy to scale up. I mean, they're working on this, but so far we're limited to 250, 300 electron volts. So you cannot do hard X-ray diffraction or uh, LH spectroscopy that, uh, that are usually more common in the, in the, in the, in the soft and hard X-ray community. Uh, and as, uh, since then, uh, I mean, now there is also operating Swissfell in uh, at PSI in Switzerland and PAL in South Korea. I work, I've done through a postdoc the, uh, an experiment at Swissfell. It's it's a very stable machine. It operates very well, and I heard also PAL. So the lessons learned from the first machine has been transmitted very well to the to this uh, to these places. Uh, another technological jump that has been done recently because now it's operating. My group has been one of the first to use this is the, um, the uh, in this case, the European XFL in Hamburg, and also LCLS2, the upgrade to LCLS in Stanford will see this, is that we go from the warm copper LINAC, uh, uh, which uh, which has the so-called klystrons, those are the objects that accelerate the electrons to the speed of light. Instead of making them a copper that you need to cool down and you cannot run very fast, you make them out of a superconductor. Uh, and in this way, you can ramp up the, the repetition rate from 100 Hz, typically, that's typically what they operate, the, the normal LINAC, to up to megahertz. And this is again a, 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 a jump in technology because now what I show you there was this nine orders of magnitude. If you now uh, jump in, in, in brilliance, uh, average brilliance, if you now go and increase a factor of 1000, the, the, the repetition rate, you go up ag again, even three orders of magnitude. So this is another, another jump, which is important. And of course, you can imagine making a kilometer long accelerator made of superconductor is not trivial. You need to cool this down all at cryogenic temperature. So it is also technologically very difficult and very expensive. Uh, and then I, will, I want also to mention that we are also uh, making an effort to build uh, uh, an, X, an FEL in, in Sweden using the existing LINAC at max four. In this case, uh, we would be in the soft X-ray regime only. So the, the missing, uh, uh, I would say is kind of the missing FEL in the world, which is would do this only. So SACLA does only hard X-ray. We would do the only the soft X-ray, which is uh, very uh, in line with the traditional spectroscopy that Sweden has. And uh, the unique uh, one of the uniqueness of this of this facility is that uh, thanks also to the synergy with the Lund Laser Lab, is that we want to be able to pump uh, with basically any any wavelength. So uh, I will tell you a bit more in in, in a second. But uh, these machines. You typically use the X-ray to probe your your sample, but then you can drive them with different radiation. And typically, this is done with uh, visible light. But we want to extend this to from the terahertz range to the uh, XV range. So uh, an idea that you can control any sort of excitation you want uh, in uh, in your research. And we are almost done. So we have the draft last week. We made the first draft of the conceptual design report, and we'll submit it soon. So we hope then we will manage to be able to find. To find a, some funding agency wanted to bring to the next step. Okay, so uh, I think I've been talking quite a lot already. Uh, I will try to go into this um, a bit an overview of the science that's been made to at this uh, at these machines. I'll try to be very high level, as I said, just to want to give an example in each of these three fields, which are the ones that be mostly represented into the uh, into the FEL community, and show you what what is the the quantum leap, I would say, that the FEL can do. You can still do the research that you were doing before the synchrotron, but you can do way more, way uh, more things now. So 
the biology is one of the first ones. I am not biology, so I hope I will say something that, that makes sense to the people like this biology. But there were uh, there was there were two problems at doing protein crystallography as uh, synchrotrons. And, if, and one was that you need to prepare macroscopic crystals because you uh, you needed a lot of them to get enough signal. And the other is the radiation damage. So you put them in, a, you, yeah, I've seen this at beam as you put this in cryogenic in, in environment. And so those are not in vivo measurement. With a free FEL, you solve both problems at once. So the boost in X-ray brilliance allows you to actually study with small crystals simply because you have more photons. And the radiation damage is actually, it's, it's a bit uh, controversial. So it's actually way worse, but uh, because the pulse is so short, you avoid it. And I will tell you, this is the principle of diffraction before destruction. And this is the way that some of the experiments are done usually. You inject whatever protein or whatever crystal you want to, to send through a jet, and then you synchronize the jet with the X-rays. And when they uh, hit each other, then there is a detector behind the X-rays, and then you get the collector scattering pattern. And um, so basically, uh, every so since every crystal and every protein comes in in a, a random order, so every image will be different. But if you do enough statistics, so you will be able to reconstruct it. And this is a, a major computational work. So, I mean, there's been consortia stuff. This is, this is difficult stuff to do. It sounds easy, but then when you have to build 3D images down to, uh, from such a complex data, it's very complicated. And one of the thing, one of the problems that we easily <laughs> figure out or, or discover at x is that every time you do an experiment, you, you, go, you go home with terabytes of data, and then you need to analyze them. So this is one of the things that, uh, that the complexity of these experiments carries with, with them. Okay, and so there is the, the idea of this of, um, of uh, diffraction before destruction comes because uh, you basically had to think how something get destroyed in real um, in, in, in real life. So the X-rays that we uh, we use they move with the speed of light, of course. Of course, the material they go a bit slower. It's, it's a refraction and so on, but basically that's the speed of light. What destroys something physically is not the uh, the light of the electrons; is when the atoms fall apart. And this is given by the speed of sound. So if you see from this number that I put on, this is an orders magnitude difference. So you can flash something with an X-ray, deposit a lot of energy, but when you take the, the picture, the thing is still is still intact, and then eventually will explode. So that's why you have a continuous jet of new of new crystals. So you have to refresh those. But what you see is still the crystal before it explodes. So you can you can learn something from it. So that's that's the the big jump that FEL allowed in uh, in, in biology. If we move to uh, another field, uh, which is uh, closer to biology than, than physics, so but uh, uh, still quite quite different, is chemistry. Uh, this um, before I explain the the, the experiments that have been done there, I, um, I I need to to make a, um, an explanation of what what does it mean to see something goes very fast. So in the experiment of the, bi the biology, we don't care. We have one beam. We 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 send it. It's very fast beam. We send it through the sample. And it gets diffracted. But imagine that you want to see a very fast motion. And your very fast means femtoseconds. How can you do this? This cannot be done because, of course, there are no mechanical shutters that works at femtosecond time scales. And there are no even electronics shutters that work at femtosecond. The best you can do is a nanosecond, a bit better than that. So the idea to do this ultra fast experiment is to use the same trick they used to, to take the picture of the hummingbird's uh, wings. And how do they do it? So if you ever try to, in, in sunlight, uh, we take your camera and take uh, a picture of the hummingbird, you will see that the wings are all fuzzy because the wings are much faster than the mechanical shutter of the camera. The trick they do when they do this, uh, maybe they, they don't tell it, but it's basically they use a flash. So they flash the poor hummingbird uh, and, and then they have, of course, a camera shutter, which, uh, which is still slow. But most, most of the light, if not all the light, if they put in a, in a dark room, comes from the moment where the flash was on. And the flashlight can be much faster than a mechanical shutter and much faster than the, uh, than the wings uh, motion of the, of the hummingbird. So here we do the same thing. So we have detectors which are slow, but we, we try to look at our sample only uh, with very uh, fast flashes. So there is a, a, a tiny difference with the hummingbird. The hummingbird is moving its, its, wings, by, its wings by itself. Uh, here, what we usually want to also, what we need is a trigger. So we take our sample, whatever it is, 
we pump it, and our pump is basically the, the, the start of the clock, the trigger. And then we go in, uh, so the, the pump doesn't go through the, to, uh, to our camera. And then we go in, we come with our probe, in this case could be the X-ray probe, and this is our flash, and this is what we look at. So we look at the, uh, at the, at the sample, you know, the, only the duration of our flash, but we look at the, at, the, at the sample, after a certain time, we give it a kick. And so basically we can control, this is very easy to do, if you want, I will, I will tell you to do how, how this is done, but you can easily control the different time, the delay between the pump and the probe. So if you do this stroboscopic, you can actually build up a movie with the different frames taking a different delta t in this in this slide. So that's the idea. So and this is what we call the pump probe experiment, which is more than half of the experiment that you do in NFEL. So the example that I showed before was not a pump probe; it was just a probe with a sample in. You could do it a pump probe; it's more complicated. But this first only the fraction only needed a probe. Uh, one of the key experiments this is also one of the light at the LCLS that was done is uh, the uh, try to probe a chemical reaction. And this is, uh, so I apologize, there is some chemistry or chemical physicists in the audience, but I'll try to, <laughs> to explain this. But basically, this is the, uh, the this one of the simplest way to picture a chemical reaction. You have, um, you have some molecules in some state that are that exist and you want to make them react and create something else okay and the, the two energy states so the final state may very well have a lower energy state but there's a barrier between going from the two states and uh, one of the trick that also was awarded a Nobel prize was to use cat catalysts so surfaces where where actually you lower this energy barrier and you favor typically by providing them thermal energies you, you favor the transition from one side to the other Okay, so you want to go from, from, from the left here to, to the right. And the, um, the point is that in between, so there is what's called the transition states, which uh, are very interesting in principle to know because this basically shows how the reaction is happening. And um, the problem is that they exist for only very short time. And the, the question is, can we ever probe it? Can we probe this, this, this transition state? And the conventional wisdom said no, because they're too fast. If you do uh, X-ray spectroscopy at a synchrotron, you just see before and after. But then uh, Anders Nilsson was one of my colleagues and one of my mentors at Stockholm University. He was their professor at, at Stanford, and he was one of the drivers of this uh, of this FEL. I said, "Well, let's try to do this with new FEL tools. I mean, this is something new. We never tried. Let's let's give it a try." Uh, people were skeptics and so on that this could work. But they actually made it work. And so basically what they did, I mean, and now I will flash this slide through, don't, don't worry about this, but basically they did, uh, did what is shown here is an X-ray absor absorption spectroscopy at carbon edge, uh, sorry, at oxygen edge, and uh, at different time delays between this pump probe that I told you. So there is a different delay between when they trigger the reaction, in this case with a femtosecond pulse, and the uh, arrival of the X-rays that probe the, uh, the structure of the thing. And they did, they did some modeling, we, we skip it, but basically what they could see is really how, uh, in this case, CO becomes CO2 on ruthenium. And this is fantastic. They made beautiful videos on, on, on this, and it's, it's very pedagogical to see. Basically what you see is that you prepare a surface where you have a CO molecule and oxygen uh, around, and you start to drive it with lasers. And these, um, these um, molecules or these atoms start to move around, and then the motion start to get increased until the, uh, the CO get quite close to the oxygen. And then what you can do really by doing this at different time delays, you can see this happening. And then you can calculate and you can figure out there is a probability for actually CO2 to form and then leave the, the substrate or eventually this CO2 couple to another oxygen and take other steps. But this is basically the first time a chemical reaction was seen kind of live. So you could make model stuff, but you actually hear experimentally, you have a fingerprint of what's going on. And this was fascinating. This has been a, like a, a revolution of how you look at this, uh, this phenomenon. Okay, so um, this is, uh, was the first two experiments, then I will go in a, in a field that is a bit closer to mine. Um, I thought to give you two experiments, but I think I will give you only one uh, because I don't want to load it too much. And so I'll skip the first one, which was with hard X-rays. And um, and a peculiar pump, which is terrace, but uh, um, but it, it's not important for for this talk. Uh, I will talk something which is closer to my traditional background, which is magnetism. 
And I, I would like to convince you that these machines, which sound so, uh, you know, so, so fancy, so complicated, and so very close to fundamental science, actually can have an impact also on our society because they allow us to tackle problems that we, where we actually had hit a roadblock. And in my case, it's something I started even doing my PhD, and it was uh, something that maybe some of you knows, but uh, the but vast majority of the information in the world is still stored in the form of magnetic uh, drives. Okay, here there was a, this is an annual picture. Even magnetic tapes is coming back. I don't know the average average audience here, but. When I was a kid, there were tapes around where you had your music store. That was before the CD even, and the, the VHS, the, the video also. But this is, I mean, it's getting very fast. And for long-term storage, tape can, can stand 30, 40 years without losing the information. So this is very, very much useful for storing something that you need very fast. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even now, uh, the Netflix servers, so where all the videos are, are still magnetic. So the SSD, which are on our laptops, are not used. They're too expensive and not so reliable as compared to magnetic uh, hard disk drives that of maybe most of you have seen. So when you need a lot of data and, and cheap, then you go for magnetic disks. So this is something that is still you know, used uh, in, in Netflix times and in uh, lockdown times. Uh, there is a bottleneck, there is a technological bottleneck because these, these hard drives are actually what, what was lost down the entire thing. So that's why, I mean, people is trying to work on this and trying to improve this. But there's another issue, which is really crucial. And people, I, I started to tell this around when I go to conferences and, and we start to make some calculations and there is people doing this. We are starting to use a substantial, still not major, but a substantial amount of electricity to heat and cool this data center. So if we are not careful so of course i mean every exponential at some point flattens out but if the exponential slope that we see now of the consumption of electricity continues the prediction is that by 2040 all the electricity in the world would be uh, used to actually uh, for, for data that means we either live a life on netflix or we have to do something about it and of course it's not sustainable so there is an idea how can we make this more efficient Okay, and one of the things is, of course, as I said, data centers, more, more than half of the energy goes into heat. So can we actually try to get this magnetic storage to be more efficient, so not to waste so much into heat? And one other idea, uh, this is very fundamental, but in a field where very fundamental ideas like the giant magnet resistance was actually then brought to, co to, to commercial technology very fast, and it's still the way that is used nowadays. And one idea was to use uh, ultra-fast lasers to control uh, the magnetization state and uh, the um, of, 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 of a magnet of the way the data is storage and it was discovered almost serendipitously uh, by um, uh, the group of Jeanne Bigot more than 20 years ago now when they noticed that if you take a, a ferromagnetic material nickel and you shoot a femtosecond laser on it then the the magnetization uh, quenches so it goes down uh, so you, you like have a magnet of a certain strength, it becomes half the strength in, in a few, uh, in less than a picosecond. This was against all the wisdom about magnetism. Magnet is much slower. There is nothing, it was thought to be in the textbooks. So no one understood this. But somehow, I mean, it was, of course, super exciting for the people in, in magnetism trying to understand this. But until there was, okay, but what can we do about this? Until there was this experiment 10 years later, where they showed that not only you can quench these magnetism, but if you actually do it properly, you can actually write uh, with a femtosecond laser pulse uh, the state of a magnetic uh, bit. So what you see here in the picture in black and white, this is basically the white is the north pole pointing towards you, and the, and the uh, black is the south pole of a, of a magnet uh, pointing uh, away from you. And, and so what you see the dots is where they basically they shoot single single laser femtosecond laser pulse and they in completely reverse the magnetization and very reproducible. So of course there was idea and they also made some calculation. This is way more efficient than the way they we, we write magnetization nowadays. So the ultimate thing we want to do, and this is a big jump, I don't expect to go into detail to understand all, all this, but the, the idea is that what is the most stable and smallest magnetic object you can write so that we can compress information and make, you know, in every disk that rotates and consume some energy, we have the largest amount of, of, of dots and also stable. And one idea was to see this uh, uh, topological uh, object, which are called skirmions. And 
people have been trying to image those, but imaging and trying to see. Uh, so if we want to use them in the harvest, we want to, we want to see them, understand how they react when we write them so that we can optimize the materials and try to make them uh, usable. So what we want to do is an experiment which is both ultra fast and looks at the ultra small if you want to the nanometer. And the idea was to, um, to do this experiment at the newly built European Expel, uh, which allows better statistics. So the, the imaging works even the older facilities, but for some of these experiments, it was not enough. So we built a higher operating machine and tried to do uh, movies of how these skirmion structures uh, look like and how they reverse upon uh, illumination with a laser pulse. And the way you do holography is uh, in, uh, so you use this technique called a magnetic uh, holographic imaging, in this case of magnetism. And the idea is relatively simple uh, if you have a coherent laser. So you, have your, you, you need to have a coherent source, which is our X-rays with a small enough wavelength so that you can actually uh, resolve the thing. And then uh, you need to have a reference hole. So you, you have your beam going through the reference and, the, uh, and your object. And this is the principle of holography because uh, what, what you do after is that after this, uh, this thing, you have two beams, one from sample of some reference which will interfere. And from the interference pattern, if you take the Fourier transform, this can be shown mathematically, you recover the original uh, real space image. Okay, so this is the key holography that you try that you uh, modulate the phase, you, you, you encode the phase information into intensity information by having two, two references. And this is what the way it works. So we did this experiment. I just want to show you the, uh, the, the results because this is new. So it, it, we were the, actually one of the, I, I think now the first users with a new uh, expensive detector that can measure at this, at this facility. So you get this scattering pattern. On the left is the one that you get by one holicity of the of the of the photon. So when you do magnetism, you always want to do the right minus left helicity so that you get a magnetic signal. You take the difference, you get the image on the right. It took us a lot of time, this is all preliminary data, but we were finally able not, not too long ago to see the first magnetic images out of this. And where are the magnetic images? It, they are here. And those are the, um, what you see here is so-called magnetic domains. I zoomed in on, on top of this. And it was the, the first step. Now we have, uh, we have some imaging samples where we expect to see these skirmions, these small objects. But at first we wanted to make sure that this thing works. And I know it's noisy, we are still working on this. But this we did with a femtosecond pulses and we also have time uh, pump probe data to show you how a synchrotron can do these things in a way, in, 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 in a better way, in a way, in, in a way, because it's a much more stable source, but it doesn't have the temporal resolution. This is what you get. So this is, we take the similar sample at Soleil, you do this holography reconstruction, you see these magnetic domains here, done with the 50 picosecond pulses. What you cannot do there at Soleil, of course, is to see, or any synchrotron to see what happens when you go, uh, when you want to see this ultra fast uh, writing of magnetic bit. Uh, okay, so this is, we, we're really happy it works now, we still have to optimize it, but I think it was, it was an effort worthwhile doing and then hopefully we'll be able to, to make the first uh, femtosecond movie at a nanoscale. Uh, we really, with a lot of frames and try to see how, how this evolves. All right, so just to, this is just a summary uh, of what I, uh, I showed you. So biology, chemistry, and physics, uh, what, you, what you can do, I think the summary of this summary is that uh, if you go to an FEL, what you can do uniquely is the combination of both um, the, uh, the short pulses and the short wavelength. If you want only short pulses, you have a tabletop laser light. If you want short wavelength, you have synchrotrons. If you want both, you need an FEL. And uh, I think I don't have that much time left. So I just want to um, tell you that maybe I'll, I'll just go quickly through these slides about how you set up a pump probe experiment in FEL. You need to think a lot about a lot of things. But uh, I would say uh, the, the most important things is that is the synchronization. So when you do an experiment there, you need to uh, find a way rather quickly to, to align spatially and temporally your, uh, your, your laser beam. I think we're getting better at this and the facilities are good at this. Uh, one thing that, that, that is very clear at the, uh, the NFL is that each experiment is different. So you really need to think a lot through. And if you do something strange, you need to talk with the people doing the experiment before to see if it's feasible. 
And let's see if uh, maybe I can actually, uh, well, okay, I can show you this. Basically, it's, it's similar to synchrotron in the sense you need to, sorry, it, no, it's similar to a laser uh, tabletop uh, experiment. You need to find spatial overlap, temporal overlap on, on reference samples, and then you go to the to your actual sample. And this is, sorry, this is not something that you don't do in a synchrotron most of the time, because typically you only use one, one beam. But when you have two beams, you need to align them in space and in time. This is, we're getting better at this, but this is sometimes what takes a lot of time in a new experiment. Okay, I'll skip this because I think uh, I think somehow I will tell you this in the in the um, in how you write the proposal. Another thing that I wanted to tell you, if you decide to or are interested in going to an FEL, is that this complicated thing of finding the sample and finding the timing and finding the overlap and so on is only the beginning. The difficult part is actually start to actually uh, get the data and analyzing it. And the, um, the reason why this is so difficult is because for most X FEL, as I showed you before with this SAS, this very noisy process, each shot is different. So for each shot of the FEL, you need to, you need to analyze it independently. So that's very different from synchrotron where you just, you know, you assume a, a reasonably average flux, but here you need to go shot to shot. This is, was difficult to make cameras that allows to do this. We have them, uh, but you need to do this. You need to think, you need to uh, prepare your codes to be able to do this quickly and efficiently. And you need to have a good ideas because uh, as I was able to show you before, I mean, the, the, the data, when you go home from FEL, the first FELs, we had tens of terabytes of data. The last experiment we did at, at, at XFEL, we had 500 terabytes and we're going up even more. So you cannot just rerun your code on, on, on such uh, data, you know, such big files. So somehow you need to have an idea just before you start. And uh, one thing that is also important, I think this I need to tell, is that when you go to such high fluences, when you go to use these powerful machines, everything behaves, non uh, behaves non-linearly. So um, what I want to communicate, I think this will be uh, online so people can maybe look at it afterwards is that uh, you should always work in a linear regime. If you take two detectors, usually there is always, you always try to think to normalize your data. And you look for a signal and usually have an I0 monitor. Um, we're trying to get better and the idea, if you can in your experiment use the same uh, I0, uh, you should. But otherwise you have to go and look for the regions. You, you plot always some sort of signal of your, uh, that you, on your main detector against the reference, shot to shot and you try to see where the linear region is. Because otherwise the normalization is impossible and you will not see anything. Okay, so that's as I promised, I'm a bit to run over time, but I would like to, to go through this. The reason why I told you these technical things is because I think they're fundamental when you, when you write a proposal to these machines. So the first thing is that, well, talk to the beam line scientists while I have enough time to discuss the issues that I briefly mentioned. Is it feasible? What we're going to look at and so on. And do your own work. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that I heard from people that is usually just the day before the deadline, they get uh, hundreds of emails, you know, if you can do this or that. Just, just do it before, ahead of time and read what can be done. So you can actually ask specific questions. And um, so LCLS and I think at the facility, they decided to run two type of experiment. One is called standard configuration and the less standard. If it's standard configuration, you're a bit more safe. But if not, you have to think that you will have to contribute with equipment, with people to actually try to make it work. And you need to, when you write your proposal, write explicitly about this, because otherwise <laughs> it's a good way to reject uh, a beam time proposal. Another crucial thing, I mean, sometimes you cannot, but if you have experiment preliminary data that you actually can see a signal, that's crucial. And if not, some sort of calculation. So it's an expensive, beam time that you uh, have very little time to make it work. So everything except the new things you want to do has to be settled. And uh, the other thing that I think is important is how to think for this, this uh, when you write such a proposal. So as I said, the, the beam time is, is, is precious. So there was a day estimate for an LCLS, one beam time cost the American taxpayers about a week, so five shifts, a million dollars. So the uh, US, uh, the uh, Department of Energy is giving any scientists there basically resources worth a million dollars to do the experiment. Y you want to, you know, be responsible <laughs> and try to, to do the best you can to 
think to answer about answer the big scientific questions in your field. You don't want to do incremental science there. And the, the, the people reviewing the proposal are top scientists in the different fields, uh, more, more than one per field. And so you need to be scientifically correct. I mean, what's important is the science is sound. Okay, so that's, and that's people that will judge you. I mean, of course, as human factors, you may have like a competitor independent, but he's not alone and stuff. I don't think anyone will block you for having a great idea, but you need to conv convince extremely good scientists about this. And you need to do, as I said, your work about feasibility checks. Otherwise, that's a way to rejection. And this is what I say to my students and postdocs and in general people who I work with. So think deep, but think simple. So answer the, the, the questions that you can formulate simply. That's usually the fundamental questions. And uh, finally, uh, these, uh, I mean, some suggestions that I, I, uh, I mean, I don't know, you can do whatever you want with them, but I think it can work. And this is the way, I mean, as I started as a postdoc, uh, join a team that's been successful. So you learn how you think and how you prepare for this in time and offer to help because this is, is a major effort for everyone involved. So if you join a team, you don't want to be a burden. You want to be a, uh, someone that actually brings new energy. So you can help with a lot of things, with sample pre characterization with simulation. Uh, the first time I did a beam time, I was keeping the logbook. I was just listening and making sure I was recording what, what people were telling. Uh, you take the, the worst shift that there are and you can work on the analysis afterwards and learn. And I think we all did it. So you get some experiments and then uh, as a supporter and then before you lead, you did an investigation. I think that's, that's just common sense. But when something is so complex, you really want to get a bit, you know, warmed up by, <laughs> by how it works in real life. And this is a slide that I always use is, uh, I mean, the, the amount of people is involved in some experiment is something that you cannot imagine. Uh, I mean, I have one paper with, I think, 45 authors. It, it's crazy. And this was not even one of the first. I think now the first with the European experiment will probably close, get close to 100. It's close to a particle physics experiment. Uh, it's very stressful time. There is a lot of people with different uh, backgrounds from very technical, very scientific. It's very easy to create misunderstanding, really frustration. You need to really make sure uh, whatever your position is to try to make the communication clear. The language is different. The backgrounds are different. But if you do it, that's usually a good way to succeed. Uh, I think that one of the way that worked in, in, in the case of win on is that we always relied, we always recognize the expertise of different people and we ask for help and give them credit. So I think that's, that's the, the thing. And I think just to conclude, sorry, I forgot the conclusion slides, but if you really want to get start to get your hands uh, dirty about the thing is to join the, um, the two days at 5 p.m. Uh, the uh, 5 30 p.m. Sorry, uh, the European XFL is giving uh, there is a town hall meeting, so everyone is welcome. So if you just go in the uh, XFL.eu and then you scroll down to announcement events, there is a Zoom link, and each of these six uh, beamlines will tell you the update, what you can do, what you cannot do, and this is a way to start to learn what you can do because there's going to be a call. Uh, I think by the end of the next month, there's going to be in just before Christmas. I, I forgot the deadline, but they will tell you more. So yes, I think with this, I forgot the thank you slide. So I thank you in, in person. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, thank you so much, Stefano. And I want to invite the audience to virtually thank uh, Stefano for his great talk. And it's time for questions. So I think uh, participants can, uh, can unmute themselves. Yeah, so donors. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, that was really great talk. Uh, <laughs> I have never been at Exfel, but I've been, uh, well, let's say, supporting the teams from home. Right. <laughs> uh, very cool. By the way, what is the stages with uh, our own Lund Exfel? What is the optimistic uh, timeline? Uh, that's I, I, it's an excellent question. So I think we are we had a, a small delay due to COVID, like everything. But our report is ready, and I think the the big difficult thing now is going to be I mean difficult. I mean the one that we really need to to find a way and to plan together is how to get the funding for eventually the technical report and the construction. So the um, so one thing is of course it will take I, I would say the best we're talking about four years from now to get it done. This I think is uh, reasonable, but also optimistic. So let's say 2025. Uh, the good news is, is I think, and this is I think a good thing that the community has done. 
we are not building identical machine. So each of us has its own strength. And I have to say, so it's pretty clear that a high rep rate machine can do something extremely well, but maybe for other experiment, this hour will be, um, you know, using the Linux 100 Hertz machine. But if you give like, you know, a very stable machine with a lot of pump possibilities, that's be fantastic. I think the community will receive it very well. So I would say 2025. And I think something that was a bit question is our design uh, interesting for the community by then? Uh, the answer is getting clearer and clearer is yes. So we will get, uh, and I think together with Max Four and the Swedish expertise in soft X-ray spectroscopy, I think this is going to be a winning, a winning card if we do it properly. Okay, well, I'm looking forward. We are yes. moving to uh, Science Village at about that time. So this will be- Fantastic. Good. I think it will be a great thing. And if we can, I think the, the cool thing is that if we have like, I saw this has been done with a neutron uh, case, the school, having young students, young postdocs want you to take this, I think is a, is, a, is, is fantastic. If, if there is not only like the machine, but all the, <laughs> the infrastructure around. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I see in a chat. Hey. Do we have any other question? Uh, if I can ask. Yeah. Yes. Who is talking? I'm oh. talking. Hello. I'm Cinzia Giannini from Italy. Ah, hi. Cinzia. Sorry, I couldn't see. Now, now you popped up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, just a curiosity. Uh, I have been studied a lot. Uh, I mean, not a lot, really. <laughs> a bit. More than a lot. Uh, quantum uh, imaging... Uh, in the visible field, uh, let's see. Right. And I wonder if there is any hope uh, in uh, in our X-ray field, because I work with X-ray, but with normal standard uh, techniques. Right. Uh, for example, in the, with this, uh, what you showed, um, for some uh, peculiar uh, experiments uh, to be done to prove uh, that uh, without the, the brilliance of the free electron laser, we have any chance uh, Mm -hmm. to reach, uh, I, I wouldn't say the same, uh, but something in the direction of the application in the quantum field. Yeah, uh, it is an excellent question. And I can tell you, this is actually where a lot of people want to go. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential. So the expert, I, I know uh, I was fascinated by a talk that I think, I hope I'm not misspelling uh, his name. If I misspell it, then you'll be cut out for the video. But I think it's Joachim Zander in, uh, in Germany they did some preliminary fantastic water flash. And I think the answer to your question is yes, it's complicated, but I think it's also complicated because, I mean, I am not an expert, I'm getting fascinated by this stuff, but I think these two communities could actually could talk more because it could be that actually we are closer than we think to this. So, so I mean, a grain of salt that maybe it's not as, as you said, it's not as, as, as easy as this high quality as maybe in the, with a normal laser, but it could be not that far. I know that some results have been done and I think there was a PRL on this uh, not too long ago. And I think it was the, the had like, you know, quantum imaging goes x-rays at a physics uh, thing. So, but we, we're going to the direction and I think it's, an, uh, it's a blue sea. Yeah, so yeah. We, with the, with the x-ray, I mean, uh, not uh, free electron laser, I have seen more than one paper. No, so sorry. I meant with the, with the FPL also. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. will look uh, for that. Yes. Uh, if you send an email, I think I have them in my bookmarks because this is, I think, this is a frontier that if we open, I think people want to go there. So to okay, do quantum X-ray science, it's it's where I think, or it's it's an in an infinite vast sea there. I think exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes.